Good morning, everyone. Uh, we are so glad to be together to worship the Lord. Uh, I pray that you will be able to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth today and, and continue in that attitude of worship as we go to God's Word together. As I begin the message this morning, uh, it struck me as we're listening to Pastor Nick lead us in the reading this morning, just how incredible that must have been to hear the very voice of God coming from a mountain covered in thick clouds and darkness. So much so that the people said, uh, Moses, Moses, you, you talk to God. We, we can't bear to hear his voice again lest he break out against us. And they, they knew that they were flawed. They knew that they struggled, that they weren't always 100% holy. Kind of reminded me of a, a bit of a story yesterday that happened. I was going to uh, a home improvement store and, um, you know, going down past Lebanon there and you get to where you turn on to 50, I think it is, take that left turn there. And as I'm sitting there waiting for the light to turn green, a police officer comes by uh, turning, going the opposite direction I was coming from. And I, uh, because police officers have gotten a really bad rap, if I'm really honest, the kind of, the, the kind of um, bigotry that so many of them have faced, I, our country hasn't seen since the Jim Crow era and the way that African Americans were treated, if I'm really honest. And so I make a habit of always waving to the police officers when I drive by. Because I want them to know that not everybody believes what's being portrayed, how they're being portrayed in the media. So I'm waving at this guy, and usually there's a somewhat of a casual wave back, but this guy is staring at my car, looking at my front tires. And I, just then, I'm sitting there, and I realize, oh, nuts, the stop line is right next to me. <laughs> Half my car is in the intersection because I got distracted by the truck that was working on the light pole on the other side of the intersection and just didn't notice. There was no excuse. And so here I am breaking the law, waving to a police officer, and he's probably thinking he's waving to try to get me not to pull him over. No, I, I was waving because I've been to other countries where they have dishonest and corruption, dishonesty and corruption throughout the police force, and I understand how blessed we really are overall a few bad apples that always need to be weeded out, but overall, we are so blessed. The level of security and the, the lack of corruption that we face from our police force in this country is a huge blessing we all take for granted. But if you travel the world a little bit, you'll start to see why it's so important. Anyhow, it, it reminded me, I knew the law. You see, I took driver's ed. I read rules of the road. I knew better. And I failed to live up to the law. <laughs> and my first thought was, oh, Lord, please don't let this police officer speak to me anymore. <laughs> or at all. <laughs> because I really don't want a ticket for something really foolish, stupid that I didn't even mean to do. Uh, I intended to stop at the line and, like I said, got <laughs> squirrel, uh, got distracted by the guy fixing the stoplight on the other side. <sighs> It just reminded me of a couple of things. Number one, it is important that you and I know God's law. Know God's revelation. Because the Old Testament isn't just about God's law. The Old Testament also, we find in it that He is patient, full of loving kindness, slow to anger, uh, abounding in covenant love. But you and I, we need to know it and we need to live it out. We need to live in light of His rules. Don't go past the stop line, so to speak, but also to know that He's gracious. And like that police officer who didn't pull me over, He gave me a stare down to let me know I'd done something wrong, but showed me mercy. You and I need to know that is a little reflection of the God that we serve. And we need to know His word. Because his word is more important than the rules of the road, than the traffic laws in the state of Illinois. Because someday those laws will go away, but his law will never go away. 
His principles and His character will never change. And so we want to be people of God and people of His Word. Now, we're going to talk about the Old Testament canon today. We don't have really, it's, I was talking to Pastor Nick, I was like, it's really kind of weird because we don't really usually have like a core passage. When I'm preaching exegetically, we always read out loud together what we're going to talk about. But because we're doing a topical one now, we kind of jump around to several different passages. So uh, that's why I promise you we will get back to a public reading together once we get back into the book of Revelation. But it's, it's kind of tough to pick which passage to read. So, and also sometimes, like right now, we don't start with Scripture. We actually start with some terms that you and I need to know. Now, this is the Jewish acronym for what we would call the Old Testament, what they would call their Scriptures, the Tanakh. And it it's comes from, like I said, it's an acronym from the Torah, which is the law. The first five books Moses wrote, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The Nevi'im the prophets, and the Ketuvim, the writings. This is the threefold division that most Jews today in, uh, around the world, if you said this word to most of them, they would understand, hey, he's talking about our Bible. And so this is, I want us to be informed. I want us to be able to interact with people um, knowing how they look at things and refer to things, especially to Jewish people, because they are the chosen people of God, even though so many of them are not walking with Him right now according to the full knowledge of the full gospel. But God isn't done with them, and God still loves them. And so we want to show them great respect and learn what we can so that we can build common ground with them to share the good news of Jesus Christ. So they call it the Tanakh. And as you can see, the TA is from the Torah, the NA is from the Nevi'im, the KH is from the Ketuvim. And I know it doesn't all make sense. I guess if you know Hebrew well, it does, but we'll just go with that for right now. Now, these books are written between 1400 and 400 B.C. So right away, you should be able to see a massive difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament, because the New Testament is written in less than 70 years. Mark to Revelation, less than 70 years probably more like 45 or 50 years. But here we have the Old Testament, which uh, I was watching some historical uh, stuff and studying for the message this week. They think that we now have a better date for the Exodus of about 452 B.C. And so that means it is possible that the, the earliest books of of the Bible are written close to that time as Moses is meeting with God face to face and God is revealing the history of creation and the history of all the things that God has done throughout time. That's when the, the Torah, the first five books of the Scripture are written down sometime in that period, I believe. And then we get to 400 BC when the last book of the New Testament is written down. It's good to know. Now, it's also good to be aware that in some ways, the, the, the further back in history you go, and this is true of just about everything that I've ever seen or studied in history, the further back you go, the harder it is to find evidence. And some of that is because writing materials break down over time. People, things get lost over time. Now, it, it is fun when we find things again, and we're going to we're going to talk about an extremely important find that happened in 1947 in a few minutes that has a massive impact on our faith in the reliability of Scripture. But the further back in history you go, the harder it is to find corroborating sources and whatnot. And that is just one of those realities of everything you study in history. But that does not mean that the sources that we do have are untrustworthy. We have the Bible and by faith, we believe that God has preserved the Bible because it is His very Word, and He wants us to know it and to live it. So the next question is, how many books should we have in the Old Testament? Now, the Tanakh has 22 or 24 books, depending on how they count it. 
The Protestant Bible has 39 books. The Roman Catholic Bible has 46 books. The Eastern Orthodox Bible has 48 books. Um, and we'll explain that here as we go forward. One interesting thing is that the Tanakh has 22 or 24 books. It, they order it differently in the Jewish Scripture, but their 22 or 24 books are the exact same books that we have, but they just group some books together. For example, Ezra and Nehemiah is one book in the Jewish Tanakh, in the Jewish, old, uh, in the Jewish Scriptures. All 12 of the minor prophets are one book. And you can start to see how the numbers are different, but the material is exactly the same. Their Bible and our Bible, the content is identical. And that's important for us to realize, for us to remember, even though the, they're organized differently. Our, our Old Testament, as you know, goes from Genesis to Malachi. Their Old Testament goes from Genesis to Chronicles. And of course, it's another compilation. So, First and Second Chronicles is one book in the Tanakh, in the Jewish Bible. And that leads to something fascinating we'll see from the words of Jesus in just a moment here. Now, there, as we mentioned already, the Catholic Bible has more books. The Eastern Orthodox Bible has even more books and, and additional chapters. And so, this is from an Eastern Orthodox website talking about the extra books they have. They have Tobit, Judah, more chapters of Esther and Daniel, the books of Maccabees, the book of the Wisdom of Solomon, the book of, the, of Syriac, the prophecy of Baruch, and the prayer of Manasseh. These are all extra books that should sound somewhat strange to us because they're not in our 39 books of the Old Testament. Now, most of these, the vast majority of these are what they call intertestamental books. They are written after Malachi. In that 400 years of silence where no, uh, I believe, that no inspired, inerrant word from God came to earth, there are these extra books that are written. Now, it's, it's good to be aware of these things, as, as with the Jewish folks, so that we can be able to strike up a conversation with knowledge with our Catholic friends or Eastern Orthodox friends or those who are considering converting or something and understand a little bit about what we're talking about. Also know why, why we don't accept these books. And so let's go and look at some scriptures and then we'll come back and look at some more history and talk a little bit more about the Old Testament Apocrypha as it's called. Um, for this reason also, the wisdom of God said, I will send to them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill, and some they will persecute, so that the blood of all the prophets shed since the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation. Now, this is Jesus speaking here in Luke 11. He is talking to the people of Israel who are showing themselves to be more and more rebellious, more and more stiff-necked, more and more unwilling to listen to what he's saying to them. And then he ends this section with, From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the house of God. Yes, I tell you, it shall be charged against this generation. In studying this this week, in finding out the difference in the order of the books, it's fascinating to look at this quote of Jesus and realize that he's quoting from Genesis to Chronicles. The implication of what he's just done is, he said, these are the inspired scriptures. Because people die in the book of Maccabees. There is a, a, a man, Maccabeus is his last name, and um, I always get his first name wrong, so I won't give you the... <laughs> Judas, thank you. Judas, and I went online this morning again just to remind myself and forgot again because I should have put it in a slide. But yes, Judas Maccabeus is killed. And you could say, well, wasn't he kind of a prophet leading God's people? And, and this is not to say that what happened in that intertestamental period is, is unimportant. But I am saying it shows the signs that it's not the inspired Word of God. And so, if Jesus thought that Judas Maccabeus was a prophet, why doesn't he say from Abel to Judas Maccabeus? If Jesus believed that First and Second Maccabees should be counted as Scripture, he would have said from 
Abel to the death of Judas Maccabeus or one of the other people. I mean, they're, they're at a time of war. There's a lot of people who died in the book of first and second, the books of first and second Maccabees. But the implication of what Jesus has just done is he's confirmed that the Jewish Old Testament, as we know it, as we have it, granted, we order it differently, but we have the exact same material, all the same that the Jewish Bible has. He's just confirmed their canon, their list of what's in and what's out of the Old Testament. And so the implication of this quote of Jesus is that he only recognizes the 22 or the 39 books that we have of the Tanakh or the Old Testament as being the Word of God. Remember again, the Tanakh and the Old Testament mean the same thing. The only difference is how you order them. But the material is identical. Now, we need to talk about the nature of God's revelation. One important thing, a, a principle, a guiding principle that we should always keep in mind. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes true concerning which he spoke to you, saying, let us go after other gods whom we have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to find out if you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And from this, we find a principle that previous revelation in the inspired word of God must line up with future revelation. Here we have signs and wonders, and God often gives signs and wonders to his prophets to confirm that he's really speaking through them. But God, through Moses writing here in Deuteronomy, says, but if somebody comes, even with signs and wonders, and says, let's go after another God, he's not speaking from the God of heaven. He is not a true representative of the God of heaven. In essence, what's being said here is the God of heaven is allowing you to be tested if you, to see if you will follow after the Baals, the Asherahs, the other gods of antiquity. But also, folks, we just talked about this same principle in Revelation. When we talked about the Antichrist and the false prophet, the false prophet will call down fire from heaven just like the prophets of the Old Testament did at times. And yet his quote-unquote revelation will not line up. He will be seeking to cause people to worship another god. The being we know is Satan. And so it's important for us to understand that God doesn't contradict his word. His word builds upon itself. Now, we do know that the law of Moses served a purpose for a time, as Paul wrote as a school teacher, to teach us how desperately we needed grace. And the Lord frees the church from the entirety of the law of Moses. As we talked about at the Jerusalem Council, we're still under four parts of it. Don't eat blood, avoid sexual sin, don't eat things that are strangled, and no part, don't take any part in idolatry. Those are directly out of the law of Moses. And Acts 15 says those are still binding on our lives. But I'm really grateful we don't have to do all of the stuff in the law of Moses. We live under grace. The law cannot save us. But notice that even in doing away with the entirety of the law, freeing us from all of it, Paul says, it still served a purpose, folks. It wasn't for no reason, folks. It wasn't meaningless. It was to teach you and me how desperately we need grace, how desperately we need the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, which is the only way to be set free from the law of sin and of death. And so the principle, we need to remind ourselves, any so-called revelation from God must not contradict what has come before. You know, Satan's revelation in the garden, oh, you won't surely die. Oh, really? Did it line up with what God said? No, God said you will surely die. He didn't mean physically, he did mean spiritually. 
And it's the same principle repeated again and again and again throughout all of time, throughout human history. Satan lies to us as human beings to try and get us away from God and away from his law. And then we're going to look at Isaiah saying pretty much the same message. Uh, When they say to you, consult the mediums and the spiritists who whisper and mutter, should they consult the dead on behalf of the living? This is an anathema to God. This is something evil that God said don't do. And yet the people in Israel were doing this. To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. In other words, they're living in in darkness. They have no light. These mutterers and spiritists are ignorant of the truth of God's Word. And once again, we find the principle. It's got to line up with what God's already spoken, or it's not from God. And Isaiah is saying, God's already spoken and said, don't go to spiritists, don't go to conjurers, don't go to people who try to contact the dead. And Isaiah is calling the nation to repent of their evil that they're living in. And then we're going to go back to the New Testament here for just a second. Jesus says something very important. Do not think I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish but to fulfill. We have to rightly understand the Word of God. Rightly understand the previous prophecy is always the check, always the way we know if future prophecy is from God or not. Now, I do need to say that I am convinced that the canon of Scripture, both New and Old Testament, is closed. There will be no more books from God because we have everything we need for life and godliness. We have the revelation of Jesus Christ that we're studying through that we'll get back to in 2021 here. There will be no longer any books added to Scripture, though many people have tried. Joseph Smith there's a very famous example of adding books to Scripture. He, he talks about, or Mormons at least today, talk about additional light. But here we find there's no additional light needed to Jesus Christ. What we need is Him and His revelation, His Word that ends at the book of, Re- book of Revelation. So even here, Jesus confesses to the continuity of the New and the Old Testament, but says, I've come to, not to abolish, but to fulfill. How does he fulfill? He fully obeys the law of God. The only person ever to accomplish this feat. The only human to ever pull this off. And so that's how the Old Testament and New Testament, the Old Covenant and New Covenant can be so different and yet still have that same principle apply that earlier revelation always is a determiner of the validity of future revelation. Now, as we've talked about before, it's become popular by some, in some circles, some very influential people, uh, Protestants, evangelicals, whatever name you want to apply to them, who said we need to unhitch the Old Covenant from the New Covenant. And I just wanted to show you a list. This is a, a, a doctor, last name Pentecost, who came up with a list. And these are all the quotes or allusions from the New Testament books pointing back to Old Testament books, writings, words. And we don't have time to read them all, but Revelation has the most It wins the contest by far, 249 illusions according to this list. There are different lists out there that come up with slightly different total numbers, but all of them are above 800 that I have seen so far. Quotations and illusions in the New Testament of the Old Testament, and it just drives home to me the fact that the New Testament authors were very aware of this fact, that this revelation from God cannot contradict what's already come It's a fulfillment of what's already come, but it lines up with what God's already said. 855 quotations and allusions from the Old Testament in the New Testament. And so that's why we're taking time to talk about the Old Testament canon. That's why this is important for you and I to know this stuff so that we don't get sucked into somebody else's lies 
There are, this world is full of false teachers and false teachings. And it grieves my heart when I hear about somebody who's walking in a church that teaches the truth like we so strenuously try, uh, uh, try to do here and ends up going to a kingdom hall, ends up going to a Mormon temple. No, they don't have the light of God. They, they cover it. They veil it again. We are trying to make it clear, clearly known to all of us here. But it's important that we know this history. It's important that we know why we believe what we believe, because when you know why, oftentimes, that is the antidote to all the lies of Satan. That's an antidote to other organizations that would seek to draw you away from a right understanding of the historical truth, the spiritual truth of God's Word in the Bible. And so, in addition to those facts, 855 or so allusions, quotations, every book of the Old Testament is quoted in the New Testament except Obadiah, Nahum, Zephaniah, and Esther. So, 35 of the 39 books of the Old Testament are quoted from or alluded to in the New Testament. And again, any person who says we need to unhitch the Old Testament is ignorant of the fact ignorant of the facts, I should say, of the interconnectedness of the new and the old covenant. You cannot separate the two because God, in His revelation, says they are both interconnected and wants us to understand that fact. And so the earlier, re early revelation from God serves as a continuing test for all future revelation from God. And this is how believers during the time of the Antichrist, the false prophet, should be able to, will be able to, if they follow God's Word, able to know the false prophet is not speaking from God. Even though the Antichrist says he's a man of peace, he's a rep direct represent representative of Satan himself who often masquerades as an angel of light. We should not be confused. We should not be surprised by that fact, folks. And so we need to remember this principle. Does it line up with the previous revelation from God? It's really important for us to know. <clears throat> We're going to look next at Matthew 22, starting at 31 here, but regarding the resurrection of the dead. Now, we've talked about this a couple weeks ago. Sadducees come with their, this wife who's married seven times and who well, Jesus, whose, whose husband will be, or whose wife will she be in the resurrection? Because they don't believe there's a resurrection. And Jesus says something fascinating here. But regarding the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God? And I was watching a video from Dr. James White this week, and he, said, he highlighted this, something that I'd read right across and hadn't noticed. He said, did you catch that? It doesn't say written by God. Spoken by God. This, this isn't some text that has been veiled. This isn't some text from Scripture that has been messed up. Jesus says when you read the Bible, it is as if God Himself is speaking directly to you and to me. Did you notice that? I read right across it. I'm grateful for somebody like James White and others who are smarter than me, better scholars than me, who go, wow, wait a second. Think about the implications of what's just been said there. God has spoken through His Word. All of it. Even the Old Covenant in which God says, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Tomorrow morning when you get up, if you don't already make a habit of it, I want to encourage you to begin reading the Bible. And I want you to remind yourself, the God of the universe, who spoke and created everything, is about to speak to me through His Word. Whether you read the New Testament or the Old Testament, any of the 66 books in His Bible, He 
is speaking through the word. The question for you and me is, will we listen? And will we by faith live it out? We're going to go back into the Old Covenant here from Deuteronomy 17, starting at verse 18. Now it shall come about when he sits on the throne of his kingdom. This is about how important God's word is. Moses is writing a prophecy, including instructions for future kings. They don't have a king yet. But someday God's told him a king will come. And here's my rules for that king. He shall write for himself a copy of this law on a scroll in the presence of the Levitical priests. It shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by carefully observing all the words of this law and these statutes. That his heart may not be lifted up above his countrymen, that he doesn't get arrogant, well, I'm king. And he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right or to the left so that he and his sons may continue long in his kingdom in the midst of Israel. Imagine how different First and Second Kings would be if they just obeyed this law. Because folks, if you want to learn something, don't just read it. Make your own copy of it. You'll be amazed how effective that is. When I uh, uh, when I went to undergrad, I got a history degree with teacher certification. This is one of the things they told us. The more parts of the human brain that you can get involved in learning, the more likely you are to learn it. So if it's something you really want to learn, like the first name of Maccabeus, I should have written it down. <laughs> uh, I should have been taking notes, and I, I didn't. But imagine how different if they had just obeyed this one command of God, if every king, if Ahab had written down copied by hand for himself all of Deuteronomy, all of the Torah, how different, and then sought to live it out. Realize this is the very God of our people, the, really, the very God of creation speaking to me. If only, if only he had done that, he would have known he should never marry Jezebel, a foreign woman who would lead his heart astray. And that's just one example. I mean, the list is endless of the kings of Israel and how they walked away from God and did not obey the covenant letter from God to them. In both the New and the Old Testament, God has spoken to us through His Word. The very God of the universe is still speaking today through His book. Don't forget that fact, folks. It's not just words on a dusty old page that we, we far too infrequently read. But according to the words of Jesus, God Himself speaks through His Word. We need to remember that and value it for what it truly is. Now, we need to talk about the Apocrypha, and this, this means those, the, those writings, Apocrypha or intertestamental period writings, those books that didn't quite make it into the canon, didn't quite rise to the level of the inspired, inerrant Word of God. Now, we saw, I, I, I read you already a list of the books in the Apocrypha. Um, I want to show you one example of why they're not in the Bible. Uh, this comes from 2 Maccabees. Chapter 12, I know this is a little weird. This may be the only time for decades that I read from Maccabees in church, but just follow with me for a second. You'll see why we did this in, in, in just a minute here. On the second day, as had now become necessary, Judas and his men went to take up the bodies of the fallen and bring them back to lie with their kindred in the sepulchers of their ancestors. So they've been at war, and a number of men have been struck down, killed during this war. Then under the tunic of each one of the dead, they found sacred tokens of the idols of Jamnia. So they have good luck charms around their neck. But it's not just a rabbit's foot, which in and of itself is bad enough, but these are idolatrous symbols seeking to have these idols protect them in battle. These men have committed an act of idolatry while supposedly serving the God of the Old Covenant. This is a serious sin. 
which the law forbids the Jews to wear. And it became clear to all that this was the reason these men had fallen. So they all blessed the ways of the Lord, the righteous judge, who reveals the things that are hidden. And they turned to supplication, praying that the sin that had been committed might be wholly blotted out. The noble Judas exhorted the people to keep themselves free from sin, for they had seen with their own eyes what had happened as a result of the sin of those who had fallen. He also took up a collection, man by man, to the amount of 2,000 drachmas of silver and sent the, uh, it to Jerusalem to provide for a sin offering. So where does God's law tell anyone to do this? Remember, the rule is previous uh, revelation dictates all future behavior, activity, sacrifices, etc., Where on earth does God ever talk about giving an offering for the dead? He does not. And so here we have a clear contradiction of the Scripture. In doing this, he acted very well and honorably, taking account of the resurrection. For if he were not expecting that those who had fallen would rise again, it would have been superfluous and foolish to pray for the dead. But if he was looking to the splendid reward that is laid up for those who fall asleep in godliness, these men had fallen asleep in an act of idolatry, and God had punished them for it. You see the contradictions throughout this text here? Had fallen asleep in godliness, it was a holy and pious thought. Therefore, he made atonement for the dead so that they might be delivered from their sin. (laughs) Folks, this is never commanded in the Old Covenant that I can find, and it is clearly against the New Covenant. Hebrews 9, 27, and inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once and after this comes purgatory, right? After this comes a sacrifice and prayers for the dead, right? No, after that comes the judgment. So I hope you can see just one example of why we don't see Maccabees, first or second, as the inspired Word of God. Because there's a contradiction of previous revelation. And that's a problem. And so, second Maccabees, just a, a note here, this serves as the bedrock for the Roman Catholic doctrine and teaching on purgatory. Oh, wait a second, we can give offerings for the dead. That is exactly what indulgences are, folks. We can pray for the dead. Why do we pray for the dead if, it, if judgment comes after this life? Well, we don't. If you take seriously that biblical principle that previous revelation must line up with all future revelation, nowhere in the Old Covenant does God talk about doing this that I can find, that anybody else I've studied has ever pointed me to. And so here's a very clear contradiction from the book of Maccabees. And so from that, we can say this isn't the Word of God. And Jesus only quotes from the Tanakh, from the Old Testament. He never quotes from the Apocrypha. Remember that. Now, I did go to Catholic Answers online to check out because they say, oh, yeah, Jesus, the Bible, New Testament alludes to the Apocrypha many, many times. And from what I can find, there is only one time, as I recall, in the book of Jude where it actually does so, where it actually alludes to something in the Apocrypha. And even that one's a little iffy. All the rest of them that I read was like, I don't see any connection here. All the rest of them are those examples of kind of when a teenager gets caught and is trying to make excuses for their bad behavior, (laughs) trying to make things up. It just didn't line up. What they said were illusions and and quotations didn't line up well at all with Scripture. But also we have that very clear contradiction this morning that we've seen. We've seen Jesus only looks at the Tanakh, the 22 or 39 books of the Old Testament, as being the inspired Word of God. Now we need to look real quickly here, because I'm running out of time again, Uh, (laughs) about some history. In 170 AD, Melito of Sardis, he's a bishop of Sardis, Remember, we talked about Sardis in Revelation. Some people think he's the bishop right after the one directly addressed in Revelation. 
170 A.D., either the one right after or the second one after that one addressed in Revelation. He gets tired of the fights about the Old Testament, so he goes to the East, to the Holy Land, to try to figure out for himself, what is the Old Testament canon? What should we have? And he comes up with the five books of Moses, and he goes on and down the list. He makes one mistake. He leaves out Esther. Esther is the least beloved book of the Old Testament, unfortunately, guys, and there's a reason for that. It never once overtly says the name of God, which is why some, even in the New Testament church, had a problem with Esther being included, and yet it is in the Tanakh. It is included in the Jewish scriptures. Also, one note that I don't even have a slide for, but in the, old, in the temple, there was a place where the scrolls of the Tanakh were laid up, laid up in the temple, a special place where biblical books were stored. None of the Apocrypha have ever been found to be included in that special place of honor where the scrolls were stored. In his 39th festal letter, Athanasius talks about the Old Testament canon. He rejects all of what the Roman Catholic Church calls the Deuterocanon, the second canon, or what we would call the Apocrypha. He rejects them all and says they're valuable for reading in section 7. We don't have time to read it today, but if you want to, you can find it online. Um, in section 7, he says these books are valuable for reading. You can learn from them that they are not the Word of God. So it doesn't tell us don't read Maccabees, but don't trust it for doctrine. Don't trust it for practice. Don't trust it for salvation. And we know what happens when you do. You end up with unbiblical doctrines like purgatory. And so Athanasius gets it all right, except he leaves out Esther. We believe ultimately God entrusted the Old Testament to the Jewish nation. And in so doing, he also caused them to come up with his canon. Jesus confirms that with his quote from a prophet dying in Genesis to a prophet dying in in Chronicles. And like I said, I've run out of time. A couple of archaeology, uh, archaeological facts here, and then we'll be done. This is the Tel Dan, 9th century BC. It's a carving. King Haziel of Damascus says that he has defeated the household of David. This is important because some have de denied that David ever existed. Some historians, unbelievers, have said, David, there's no other evidence other than the Bible, which we all know the Bible is really good historical evidence, but they foolishly reject that. But here is an inscription talking about the household of David that was carved by a foreign king in the 9th century B.C. Outside evidence that David was real. He was recognized as the great king of Israel, and his sons here are, this king is bragging, I defeated his sons as kings. Dead Sea Scrolls are of incalculable worth to proving the validity of the Old Testament. And before the Dead Sea Scrolls, or DSS, were discovered, the oldest manuscript of the Hebrew Bible dated to 980 AD. Now, last week we talked about how what you really want is a text, a, a copy from as close to the original as possible. So, up to 1947, the closest one we have is 2,400 years after the writing, give or take. 2,400 years. And so the Dead Sea Scrolls are discovered in a cave in Israel in 1947. And that puts us 1,000 to 1,200 years closer. And it's amazing how close the Dead Sea Scrolls were to the Masoretic text that we use that was, you know, the oldest one we had, 980 A.D. But it's amazing how close they, those two were. And what it showed is there was a great deal of respect for this text over time. People weren't just willy-nilly taking things out and putting things in. And so the Dead Sea or Qumran Scrolls have a remarkable coherence, the, the Masoretic text, the MT here, from 980 A.D. For example, Isaiah is 95% identical to the Masoretic text. 95%. The other differences are very minuscule. There's some spelling differences. There's some, uh, uh, I'd almost call it punctuation differences. It's a little different in Hebrew. Uh, but they lined up incredibly well. 
The Daniel scroll had the most copies found at Qumran. This community, they, they believe it's the Essenes at Qumran, really liked Daniel. You know that because they had lots of copies, fragments of Daniel are spread around in the Dead Sea Scroll caves. And people have tried to say, secular scholars have tried to say, Daniel has to be written at 200 B.C., no earlier than 200 B.C., because his prophecies of the Ptolemies and the Seleucids fighting are just too accurate. They have to be written after that's already happened because we know there's no God who's smart enough to know future history and to tell us about it before it happens. That's the secular mindset. And here we have in this community books that were written between 200 B.C., the Essenes, 200 B.C. and 68 A.D. So if Daniel's written in 200 B.C., the writing style of Daniel should be the same as what we find in this community when they wrote down their rules. Because this community, the Essenes, they believe it was, that wrote and, and tr stored up the Dead Sea Scrolls, had rules that they wrote in their own time, in their own script, in their own language. And the Hebrew and the Aramaic of Daniel is very different from the community records of the Qumran found with it. And what that tells us is that Daniel existed long before the time of the Essenes. Daniel was not written in 200 B.C. Daniel was a prophecy from the God of the universe telling us what would come. Because it's like, to, to put it in a modern terms, and I know some of y'all in this room remember the term groovy. Yeah, because it was y'all lived through a time when things were groovy. And nobody talks about that anymore, right? Nobody uses that phrase anymore. If you read a book that talks about something being groovy, you can instantly guess, even from that, Either this person is living in the past, or this book is written in the late 60s to 70s. And of course, we have all kinds of idioms today that tell us the way that our language continues to evolve, that you can find things that were from the 1980s that were very unique, from the 1990s that were very unique in language. And so if somebody wrote a book, you can see things. I listen to pastors preaching, and Adrian Rogers is often on the radio when I'm driving into work. And so I hear Adrian Rogers preaching about things. And the other day he was preaching about the election of Bill Clinton. I could know when that message happened, even without being told, because of the context. And here we find evidence that we can know that Daniel was written when the Bible says it was. Because the language had changed. The writing in both Hebrew and Aramaic in the community of the Essenes is different than the Hebrew and the Aramaic included in Daniel. And folks, walking away this morning, what's your big takeaway? It's the same thing as last week. We can rest assured that God has given us His Word in both the New and the Old Testament. It is the God of heaven Himself speaking to you and me. Don't forget that. Don't ever let a servant of Satan take that faith away from you. God has spoken in His Word. And we do well to listen to it, to obey it, to live it out. Father God, I thank You so much for today. I thank You so much for each and every person who's here today. God, we need your Holy Spirit to help us live by the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus so that we don't live by the law of sin and of death. Thank you for speaking to us through your word so that we know you love us. You know, we know your commands for how we live. Help us, Lord, to live them out. Help us never to give in to somebody who wants to undermine your word because this is the most incredible thing that's ever been recorded in all of human history. Thank you for the Bible. In Jesus' name, amen.